distinguished foreign minister, consuls general, your excellencies, and friends. Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Chicago for this year's King Abdullah II Leadership Lecture. Uh, my name is Colin Wamurhertig and I'm the Dean of the Harris School of Public Policy Studies here at the University. The King Abdullah Leadership Lecture brings to the University uh, current and former world leaders uh, to share their insights and wisdom on world affairs and to bring us up to date on thinking in important and sometimes unstable parts of the world. Uh, these activities greatly enrich our intellectual life here at the University and as uh, Dominic Washington mentioned, after the formal remarks we will have a question and answer session uh, which the Foreign Minister has kindly agreed to submit himself to while recognizing that the university prides itself on being difficult in addressing questions to distinguished speakers. Now, many of you will have noticed, in fact, I'm sure all of you will have noticed over the past few days a, a great deal of uh, international activity here in the city of Chicago. Uh, and this event really caps for us this whole series of activities uh, in the city and the university. Uh, and a manifestation of this is in our first activity this afternoon, which precedes the lecture itself, in which we will sign an agreement between the University of Chicago and the government of the Republic of Turkey that will promote research and educational exchanges between the two. This, I think, will be the foundation for an increase in our engagement with Turkey. We feel, as, as most people recognize, that Turkey plays a crucial role in the future of world peace, both uh, to the west in Europe and to the south and east in Asia, and we're delighted to be able to collaborate with the government of Turkey in forwarding both our enthusiasm for engagement across the world and also their enthusiasm for exchanging with us uh, researchers and students who will come here to visit at the University of Chicago. Uh, I would now like, as part of this initial activity, to invite uh, Turkish Foreign Minister Dr. Ahmed Davatoglu uh, Turkish Consul General Fatih Yildiz, uh, Harris School Dean's International Council members Dr. Tony Goryeb and Mr. Mehmet Chelebi, David Green, Executive Vice President uh, of the University of Chicago, and Mr. Khan to join me here for the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding between our two institutions. And now to introduce Dr. Ahmed Davitoglu, I would like to welcome Mr. Mehmet Chelebi, uh, who is a member of the Harris School Dean's International Council, uh, to introduce the minister. Mehmet is a businessman, uh, a member of the DIC, uh, and has been working tirelessly, not only on behalf of the school, but also in many venues and in many ways to foster understanding among uh, different ethnic groups uh, across the United States and across the world. In particular, he has been involved in the US with activities involving the Greek, Armenian, Jewish, and Arab communities, four communities who are not always known uh, for the best of relationships among themselves, and one of Mehmed's efforts is involved in improving this situation insofar as possible. 
and he's recently been appointed a goodwill ambassador for the United Nations to the Asuni ITT initiative in Amazonian Ecuador. We are grateful for Mehmed's work on behalf of the school, and I would now like to ask him to introduce our distinguished guest. Thank you. His Excellency Dr. Ahmed Davutoglu, Foreign Minister of Turkey, Dean Kolm Omuhurtek. I got it. He pronounced my <laughs> Dean of the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago, distinguished guests, faculty, and students. Multilateral foreign policy, zero problems with neighbors, rhythmic dipl diplomacy, engagement of relations based on freedom and trust, new diplomatic approach, maximum cooperation, full integration. These are just a few foreign policy approaches our keynote speaker has introduced to not only Turkey, but dozens of countries in, in the territory spanning across emerging Europe, the Middle East, North Africa, and, and beyond. His Excellency Dr. Ahmed Davutoglu, the academic turned diplomat and inspirational community leader, an influential thinker and a politician, has worked persistently to build Turkey into a regional powerhouse. Turkey's external outlook has been unmistakably the design of Dr. Ahmed Davutoglu, known for a tireless work ethic which I have witnessed over the last several years. Dr. Davutoglu has embraced Turkey's newfound position as a bridge between rivals. Dr. Ahmed, Ahmed Davutoglu, or uh, Ahmed Hoja as many of us call him, meaning the professor, his visionary policy of zero problems with neighbor has been unanimously welcomed by all political parties in Turkey, including the opposition parties. With the crisis of the Arab Spring, his vision came to a pass as Turkey achieved a level of influence in the Middle East it, hasn't, it hadn't seen since the Ottoman Empire. Turkey is arguably one of the few unequivocal winners in the region's turmoil so far, after conscientiously opting to side with the Arab peoples in their struggle and revolt against autocratic regimes, something I have personally experienced firsthand in my frequent visits to the Middle East, where thanks to his policies, Turkey is viewed overwhelmingly positively and as an inspiration to tens of millions of Arabs, especially the youth. No matter what Arab country you go to, when people learn I am Turkish, they immediately start talking about the latest Turkish soap operas, what we call uh, soft power, their, admira their admiration for Turkish leaders and Turkey's regional policies, its economy, as well as their hope their country would one day become like Turkey. The following quote from Dr. Davutoglu helps us clearly understand his dynamic approach in foreign policy. Last year, he was quoted regarding a discussion he had with EU members, for foreign ministers in Finland, discussing the future of Europe. He said, they asked me the following question. How come Turkey is able to conduct active foreign policy while EU countries are trailing behind following in its footsteps? I said, if there's a crisis in X country, I can come to a decision in 30 minutes. Validating my decision takes another 30 minutes. And since the airplane is waiting at the airport, I can go to that country and within three hours can implement my decision. As for EU, the same decision would need to be discussed among the 27 EU member countries and will likely come up with various decisions, some contradicting each other. In order not to agitate any member state, they will come to a decision to not come to any decision. This process will take about a week, during which another crisis will arise. Actors who can adjust to history's accelerating speed will be those who can institutionalize and take sequential decisions. Professor Davutoglu was born on February 26, 1959 in Konya, Turkey. In 1983, he graduated from the Vassar's University with a double major in political science and economics at the Faculty of Economics and Administrative Sciences. In 1990, he became an ass assistant professor at the International Islamic University in Malaysia. In 1993, he became an associate professor, and between 1995 and 99, he worked at Marmara University. He worked at Bekent University in Istanbul as a professor from 95 to 2004. Professor Davutoglu published several books and articles on foreign policy in Turkish and English. His books and articles have also been translated into several languages, including Japanese, Portuguese, Russian, Arabic, Persian, and Albanian. On May, on May 1st, 2009, luckily for those of us who are huge fans of his thinking and vision, he was appointed as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the 60th government of the Republic of Turkey. Thanks to Ahmet Hoca's active diplomacy, former US, former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, even years after his retirement, has had a resurgence of popularity. In fact, these days, Henry Kissinger is often called the Ahmet Davutoglu of America. 
For a minister, Dawood Tola was recently recognized in Time Magazine's 2012 100 list, and prior to that as the Foreign Policy Magazine's Top 100 Global Thinkers. It is my distinct and profound, uh, profound pleasure to introduce to you my mentor, someone I have a profound admiration for, who always gives me inspiration, whose modest and genteel approach puts any person he's negotiating with, with at, at ease. Our, own, our very own Ahmed Oja, Turkey's Foreign Minister, Dr. Ahmed Davutoğlu. Thank you very much, my dear friend, Mehmet Bey. Dean, uh, dear Dean, Mr. Kolm, Omir Hartak, right? Dear members of Harris School, dear students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me thank the uh, University of Chicago and Harris School for inviting me to this uh, extraordinarily important event and to share my views with you Really, it is special for me for several reasons. To be here, to be in Chicago, as an academician and as a Minister of Foreign Affairs. First, being an academician to, be in, at, uh, to give a lecture uh, at University of Chicago is special because University of Chicago is well known with the academic success. As an academician, if I had chance, in the future I don't know whether I will be having a chance, I would prefer to be at this high esteemed uh, academic institute, to be part of this great legacy, which had 87 Nobel Prize winner, starting with Albert Michelson in 1907, high, uh, the discovery of uh, speed of light, from that time as the first Nobel Prize winner in American history, until today, uh, Milton Friedman, Willard Levy, many of Nobel Prize winners from the, uh, this uh, academic institution. And of course, I should not forget President Obama, who was a senior lecturer at the uh, Faculty of Laws at uh, University of Chicago, and he is also one of the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize winners. I think the motto of this university is, speaks for itself. Cresca scientia vita exculator. Let knowledge increase so that life might be enriched. This is, this is so important uh, motto for me because life and knowledge, knowledge and life, or theory and practice. I was prepared myself from primary school until 2002, always on the side of knowledge. I planned my wife, uh, my life, not my wife, <laughs> <laughs> she planned everything, not I. <laughs> she planned everything, fortunately, so that I can function as a Minister of Foreign Affairs. I planned my life uh, to be on the knowledge side. Of course, you cannot separate knowledge and life. But I was thinking that I would be writing several books, articles, uh, and of course students. Therefore in uh, Turkish when Mehmet Bey said hoca, hoca means in Turkish scholar, master, mentor, whatever you say. It is such an important title for me. It was interesting uh, when I became minister, before I became minister, when I was chief advisor of prime minister, since I was still between theory and practice, somewhere in between, not politician at that time, and between knowledge and life, everybody was calling me hoca means my professor, my mentor. After I became minister, in, the, in my ministry, those ambassadors who were calling me hoca, hocam, they continued to say hocam. Uh, and whenever they say hocam because of their habit, they were apologizing. Oh, sorry, Mr. Minister, I have to say, Mr. Minister, I said, if you next time apologize because of calling me hoca, I will punish you because being an academician, being a hoja, is permanent. Being a minister is temporary. You can be a minister only for a while, but once you became hoja or mentor, you are hoja forever. Therefore, here I am sharing my views with you as an academician, as someone, uh, a student and a hoja at the same time uh, in this 
esteemed institution, not just as a minister. Therefore, it is great pleasure for me to be in this academic atmosphere to discuss knowledge. Of course, there is a life side or theory and practice. Uh, secondly, it is meaningful to be in Chicago, not only because of academic background, to understand the flow of history and to understand the global society. I think I am, I taught not only history or international relations, but I taught also history of cities. Every city makes me a reflection and inspiration. Uh, of course, history of Chicago as a city is not an, as old as Istanbul or Rome or uh, Vienna or Marrakesh or Cairo or, or Jerusalem. A new city. But in this new city, comparatively, a, a tradition of global society is surviving. It is so interesting. In New York, of course, we know a huge, big, very big city. Uh, United Nations is there. But a small United Nations is living in Chicago. That's what I observed whenever I came to Chicago. It was also interesting when we had ministers of foreign affairs meetings uh, hosted by uh, my dear colleague Hillary Clinton a few days ago, many of our colleagues in their tanks, they said, today I met my citizens, my diaspora in Chicago, Lithuanian, Lithuanian, Estonian, all. They said they had a diaspora in Chicago. It means there is a global society living in Chicago. It means those who want to understand global flow or global mechanism of uh, change, uh, they should understand the spirit of Chicago. And President Obama, uh, whom I always admire, uh, is, uh, I think, reflects in his foreign policy this multicultural character as well. It was interesting, maybe I will just share this, and that's important. Maybe I, I, maybe I will share in my theoretical analysis uh, that part. Uh, but. This spirit of Chicago is important for coexistence, for living together, for the future of, the, of a much more inclusive global society. Now, when, we, when I talk on practic, uh, practice, let me, what, since I will be giving some details about Turkish foreign policy, let me share my last program uh, in last few days then you can understand Chicago as well as Turkish foreign policy. You may now think, what is the relation? Before coming here, I was in Greek Orthodox Church, where the bishop was, who, uh, was someone who migrated from Izmir to Chicago. From here, on the way to airport, I will be visiting Assyrian Orthodox Church again, having origins from Anatolia. Yesterday, the day before yesterday, I met with a uh, uh, representative of American Syrian community who, tried to who wanted to discuss with me about the future of Syria. There is a Syrian, I was positively surprised seeing such a dynamic Syrian community living in uh, Chicago. Meanwhile, together with President Gül, my president, we met with the representatives of Muslim community. Some were from Palestine, some were from Morocco, some were from Indonesia, uh, Pakistan, India, a group of people from different corners of the world. And we met the diaspora of Somalia. Somalia, leaders of Somalia. You know, again, I will refer to our foreign, in our foreign policy how we approach to certain issues, especially the uh, global consciousness of humanity today is in Somalia. And in our foreign policy, Somalia has a special place. Uh, no problem, you can... <laughs> Don't hurry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so uh, you can uh, understand the uh, weakness or the, the challenges of global society regarding the issues like in Somalia. We met with Somalian leaders and they told us that 
they see Turkey as their homeland because of recent Turkish foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Somalia. Uh, Prime Minister Erdogan visited Somalia with a delegation of 200 leading intellectual businessmen. And uh, now in Somalia, there is only one full-fledged functioning embassy. It is Turkish embassy. There is only one regular flight to Mogadishu after 20 years. It is Turkish Airlines from Istanbul to some Mogadishu. And all Turkish NGOs are doing the, uh, working there. We restored many hospitals in Somalia. In the last six, seven months, we spent around uh, 300 million US dollars reserved for Somalia and spent some of these. And they came and they said, since they don't have any embassy in uh, Washington, they see Turkish embassy as their embassy and they see our consul general as their consul general in Chicago. So you can see this range of uh, scope of the interest of Turkey. Sometimes because of humanitarian aspects, sometimes because of our historical background. Of course, I forgot to say, I also got uh, uh, a, an award of Macedonian Friendship Award by Macedonian community led by President of Macedonia in the evening. I, uh, and I met with the uh, diaspora of Balkan countries, Macedonia, Albanian, Bosnia, Herzegovinian. So from Macedonia to Somalia, from Bosnia, Herzegovina to uh, Far East, uh, everywhere, or Syria, there is a Turkish interest and Turkish vision now. How and what do we mean by this? And how can we connect this knowledge and life? In 1999, I started to write a book, and it was published in 2001. It was called and printed, published in Turkish, uh, Strategic Depth, uh, 600 pages. I, in this uh, book, I tried to analyze the geography and history of Turkey as two permanent parameters of foreign policy. And I was planning to write afterwards historical depth, philosophical depth, and another three books in, after this, in five, six years. But seeing because of uh, writing that book first, I was punished and I became chief advisor of Prime Minister in 2002. From that time until now, I am in practice. So every country has its own unique characteristics and those leaders, intellectuals, who understand and reinterprets that characteristics in the new context, dynamic context of history, they can change the paradigm. There is no destiny of failure. When I wrote that book, it was a, a, a new strategic framework. Turkish society was under depression because of earthquake in 1999, because of economic crisis which was worse than economic crisis in Greece today, and because of several political crises. From those days in 2001, today, in 2012, everybody is talking Turkey as a rising power. What is the first intellectual background and also practical implementation of this background? Let me uh, try to uh, summarize uh, some of these events. First of all, in 1989, when Francis Fukuyama wrote his famous article, The End of History, I, I wrote uh, a counter response and it was published later in 1991 and later as a book in 1994, Civilizational Transformation. My argument was the history did not end and will never end. The history will flow even faster than today. Why, and from that time, in 1989, until today, I can say there were three big earth earthquakes in history and in, uh, in international relations. And in every of these earthquakes, Turkey, United States, and NATO, since we were talking, I mean, we, we are here on, uh, with NATO, I will make some references to NATO. 
the responses were important because the United States was a global winner of the Cold War and as global power has had certain responsibilities. Whenever you have a power, you have ethical responsibility. If you are powerless, you don't have any responsibility. So transformation of American foreign policy is uh, uh, from, from, a, from one center of bipolar world into a new global power. And Turkish, Turkey as a regional power with multidimensional character uh, in, regional, uh, in the sense of regional identity is also an interesting case to study. What are these three earthquakes? And how did they influence our foreign policy, Turkish foreign policy as well as American foreign policy, and also relevance to NATO. The first earthquake was in 1991, when Soviet Union collapsed. I call this a geopolitical earthquake. The old bipolar uh, geopolitical structure of Cold War has ended. Several risks did emerge. Second earthquake was 9-11, 2001 because of 9-11. I call this a security earthquake. The perception of security has changed not only in the United States or in New York, but everywhere in the world. The third earthquake is 2011. Started earlier, 2008-9, but reached to the peak in 2011, which is an a, a poly, economy political earthquake. Global economic crisis, European financial economic crisis, and also a huge political transformation in the Middle East. Several risks and opportunities at the same time. Let me say a few words about the first earthquake. The first earthquake, in fact, was the most favorite one for us, for NATO, for US, for Turkey, because we were on the winning side of long uh, continuing, f almost half a century continuing uh, Cold War. American strategy for this, there was the general trend because of the end of Cold War, the general trend was democratization, freedom, global, the first glo term global transformation, globalization started at that time. So there was an understanding for American society that they are leading the uh, new uh, world and that the new world was used as the terminology at that time. And that wave of democracy was successful in Balkans in Eastern Europe. Several former communist regimes became democratic regimes and became member of EU. But in those days, it was a great mistake by international community in general, but, but by US and EU in particular, the demands of democratic societies in the Middle East were seen as a risk element in Algeria, in Tunisia, in uh, uh, Jordan. There were some democratization processes, you know. It was seen like a potential threat. Therefore, those who encouraged democracy in Eastern Balka uh, Europe and Balkans were reluctant to support democracy in the Middle East. One, second, the Oslo process, Madrid process, which started to uh, find a solution for Palestinian issue, were not successful, and it did not create any positive result. That created, created a frustration in the Middle East. And as Turkey, when we look on those 1990s, when the general trend was in favor, in the direction of democratization, in the direction of freedom, Turkey was very defensive because of terrorist attacks, because of coalitions and economic crisis, Turkey did not perform well. And just to give you uh, a statistic, in uh, 1991, our per capita income was around uh, 2,500. In 2001, it was around 2,800, 900. So, our per capita income remained the same. There was a more self-defensive or apologetic uh, position in foreign policy, trying to protect the borders 
because of these PKK attacks or other threats. And trying, first time, we realize these new uh, elements, new, uh, let me say, uh, neighbors, uh, which we share the same history because of war in Bosnia and in Kosovo and in Central Asia. There was a huge opportunity because of this emergence of new Turkish-speaking republics in Central Asia, in Caucasia, in Balkans. But at the same time, because of not having necessary reforms in the country, there was an, uh, a, a fear of uh, division, a fear of security. So it was more security-oriented foreign policy, security-oriented politics in Turkey. After the second earthquake in 2001, it was interesting. This time, the flow was the opposite. After 9-11, uh, by uh, first in United States, but later in almost all Europe, there was more security-oriented politics. Security became the focus of everything, focus of domestic politics, focus of foreign policy, and there were several restrictions. Rather than democracy, more security measures came to the picture. In Turkey, with our government started in 2002, our preference were, was more in the direction of freedom and democracy. And in my first speech in TV, uh, in, a, in a TV interview in 2003, I said that we have to create a new balance between freedom and security. This is very important. Today, in the Middle East, the problem uh, uh, originates from this imbalance between freedom and security. What we were telling in all the GARN programs, that we will not sacrifice security for freedom or freedom for security. Ultimate objective of any political system is to provide to their citizens security without sacrificing freedom and freedom without sacrificing security. Because if you sacrifice freedom for security, you have autocratic regimes. If you sacrifice security for your freedom, you have chaotic regimes. The best regime is giving as much freedom as possible without limiting or risking security. So from 2001 until 2011, Turkey has performed an excellent uh, pro uh, pro program uh, in the sense of democratization in politics, democratization, economic growth, and active foreign policy. And these three interacted to each other. Because of our democratization, uh, uh, pro democratic processes, Turkey became more strong and Turkish political, we had political stability in Turkey. Our party won three subsequent elections with increasing votes. We started with 36%. In 2007, it was 48%. Uh, for, uh, 48%. In last election last year, more than almost 50%. And we won two municipal elections, two referenda. First time ever, even rare in Europe, a political party is increasing votes in every election. Why? Because we trust to the people and we try to enlarge freedom without risking security. This is an important point. In fact, today in, in uh, Middle Eastern societies, they, are, they want to do the same thing. They want to have the same thing. They want to have a free democratic society while the autocratic regimes have been telling them, don't ask democracy from us because we are at war against Israel, we, our lands being occupied, we need to have a strong army, we need to have an autocratic structure in order to defend our lands. And the same autocratic regimes turned their face to the, to, to, to the West and said, don't ask democracy from us because if we go, Islamic radicalism will come. Then among themselves they said, we should keep this status quo because if we leave this status quo, chaos will come. Turkish case has proven that democracy 
brings stability rather than chaos, economic development, and a democratic country, Turkey, can follow a much more assertive foreign policy with dignity than the autocratic regimes. So, last, from 2001 until 2011, in the second earthquake, that was Turkish performance. American society, during the same time, was, became, American foreign policy became more uh, security oriented and, you know, uh, intervention to Afghanistan, to Iraq, just to use power in order to secure uh, the, the security, in order to guarantee the security. Of course, this more unilateral approach compared to 1990s created some reactions as well. And President Obama, when he declared his policy of multilateralism after he became president, was the right time. It was interesting. I can share this with you since it was published in 2002. After 9-11, when uh, in a TV interview, uh, I was asked to you, uh, what will be the uh, future reaction of American foreign policy regarding 9-11, after one week after 9-11. I said, we understand there is a psychological trauma in American society because American society always felt that they are immune of any attack because of the geographical distance from Afro-Euro-Asia. There are only two possibilities of risk, terrorist attack or nuclear attack. But 9-11 changed all these. But the important thing now at this moment is, and later I gave a conference in, at Princeton in 2002, April, the same argument I used, I said, but for American society, the future uh, lies in a wise approach. And today, the United States needs a Marcus Aurelius from Boston rather than a Caesar from Texas. At Princeton, I said, and I said, uh, uh, only a black president can uh, be a good remedy for this trauma so that the inclusiveness of American society, which is the base of everything, could be uh, re-motivating American society into a global power. It was not a prophecy, but just an analysis, because the strength of American society is inclusiveness. German identity, you can be German if you are real German. Still, we, our citizens in Tur Turkish people in Germany, they have this problem. It is difficult to say Turkish German, but it is so easy to say Turkish American, Jewish American, Armenian American, Greek American, Assyrian American, Latin American. So American identity is a geographical identity, which is much more inclusive. This is the base of United States as a global power. And that security era from 9-11 until uh, uh, pre uh, President Obama became president, until the next earthquake, I, I would say, created a new, a new discussion in American society, also in NATO. NATO was intervened in uh, Afghanistan. In 1990s, NATO intervened Bosnia and Kosovo. In 2000, years 2000, in Afghanistan. But in this last earthquake, which I call an, an economy political earthquake, is much more comprehensive and will be more, we will need more time to find alternative ways. What do I mean by this? For example, today, if every morning, whenever every morning I wake up in Ankara, usually I don't wake up in Ankara, I wake up in different cities, but when you are, we are in Ankara, when we, I turn my face, I have a map in my office and everywhere I like maps. When I turn my head to west from Greece up to Spain, Ireland, Portugal, there is a zone of economic crisis. When I turn my face to south from Syria up to Morocco, there is a zone of political crisis. When I turn my head to east, to right, from Afghanistan to Pakistan, Central Asia, 
uh, India, we have a zone of Iran and Gulf, a zone of uh, instability and problem of security. Right at the center, there is a country like an island for last many years continue to have an economic growth. Today, Turkish economy is uh, the second fastest growing economy, 8.5 in last quarter percent. Our uh, public debt ratio is only 39 percent to GDP. You can compare with other countries, United States around 90s. Greece is more than 150 percent, all. Our democracy has been strengthened. Our foreign policy is everywhere. And these are supporting to each other. And I can tell you, despite of sometimes some uh, different views, this era became uh, uh, a, a very promising era in Turkish-American relations because uh, United States realized the potential of Turkey as a problem solver, as a country having uh, not only being a rising economic power, but rising a donor country. Turkey is a rising donor country now. Every year we are donating our official donation only is around $1.5 billion. Without this, not loan, it's just donations, like what I said to Somalia, $300 million to Afghanistan and many places. And this created a new, a new momentum. But the risk is still there. The risk is still there. We want to be a member of EU, but the future of EU is not clear. What will be the future of Eurozone? What will be the future of uh, European integration in general sense? Of course, Whatever happens in, Euro, in, Euro, in Europe, European Union, we will continue to have this strategic choice because Turkey is part of European history and will continue to be part of European history. Whatever some of our allies in Europe thinks, even their history cannot be written without using Turkish archives. This is a historical fact. Turks are part of European continent, and will continue to be so. In this ceremony here regarding Macedonian Friendship Award, I told, I spoke to Macedonian diaspora and I said, thanks for this award of friendship, but don't think that I am your friend. I am one of you. I am a Macedonian. Because it is interesting to say to you, there are more Macedonians living in Turkey, Macedonian origin people living in Turkey than in Macedonia. There are more Albanians living in Turkey than in Albania. There are more Bosniaks living in Turkey than in Bosnia. There are more Abkhazians living in Turkey than Abkhazia. There are more Chechens living in Turkey than Chechenia. There are almost more Georgians living in Turkey than Georgia. Turkey is accumulation of all these Balkan, Caucasian, Middle Eastern people. That, that historical tradition continues. And even in our understanding to diaspora, we always said, and in last ambassador conference I underlined this, that all those who migrated from Anatolia, Armenian, Greek, Muslims, Christian, Assyrians, they are all our diaspora. Because we share the same history, the same destiny. Now, in this, uh, perspective, we are European. But on another perspective, when we go to uh, uh, Central Asia, to, to North Afghanistan, they see us as their uh, best, not only best friend, the only country who can help them. When I went to North Afghanistan, to Balh, the governor of Balh was asking from us school, children playground, park. A journalist told later, he is asking from you as if he is not governor of Belh. Belh is an Afghan province, as if he is not governor of Belh, but, but a governor of Konya. Konya is my hometown. So he's so, uh, I mean, demanding. 
Yes, he has the right to demand from us. We don't say, why are you demanding? Because this is a historic responsibility. We are a European in Brussels. We are a Balkan nation in Sarajevo. We are a Turkish Turanic nation in Belh or in Samarkand or in Bishkek. When there was civil war in Bishkek, the first minister who went to Bishkek was me. And with the president of uh, Kyrgyzstan, we did first reconciliation uh, meeting in Bishkek. When, I am, when we are in Cairo, we are from our Middle Eastern Arab, Muslim, Turkish tradition. Therefore, last year when Prime Minister Erdogan went to uh, Egypt, 30,000 people welcomed him in the, air, in the airport. When he went to Libya, 10,000 of people welcomed him in every city, Tripoli, Misrata, Tajura, Benghazi, with thousands of Turkish flags. When we are in Somalia, we are African, but more than African, we are human beings to help them. Not to dictate them, but to help them and to share their pains. This is our new understanding of foreign policy. Our foreign policy will be everywhere. In the last two and a half years, we opened 21 embassies in Africa. In 87 years of Turkish Republic, only 12 embassies were in Africa. Only 12. In the last two and a half years, we opened 21 new embassies. Now we have 33 embassies in Africa, almost everywhere in Africa. We opened three new embassies in Latin America, three new embassies in Far East. So in two and a half years, we increased our diplomatic representation 35% more. So this is how we are seeing. This is historically correct, economically rational, and politically necessary. We cannot be stable in Anatolia if we are not active everywhere in the world, everywhere in surrounding regions. And it is economically rational because with these regions only we can be one of the 10 uh, big economies in the world in 2023, 100th anniversary of our republic. Because all the other countries around uh, in these nine, they are continental countries like United States, like China, like India, like Russia, like Canada, so, or uh, European Union and Germany. We can be one of them only if we are mobilizing our manpower, humanity, human beings. This is, we did not discover oil or natural gas in the last nine years, but our per capita income has increased four times. From 2,800, now we have around 11,000, more than 11,000. In a few months, more, maybe 12,000. Our per GDP was, $250 billion in 2002. Now our GDP is around $800 million and PPP parity one more, more than $1 trillion US dollars. How did we achieve this? We did not find natural oil or gas, but what we discovered was the quality of our manpower and woman power, of course, not only. So this is the main uh, agenda. In this, with this new approach of Turkish foreign policy and the global challenges we are facing today of NATO and United States, of course the role of Turkey in NATO has increased. Of course, Turkish-American relation today has a new framework, has a new paradigm. Not on, we are not talking only on certain issues which are critical to, to Turkey like Cyprus issue or uh, Bosnia in 1990s. We are not talking only in Iraq, on Iraq like in 2000. Now we are talking everything to make future plans. Because what we think as Turkey, not only as a Minister of Foreign Affairs, but as an intellectual, I can tell you, there will be a new global order. This international order is not sustainable anymore. And this new global order, in political sense, should be more inclusive, in economic sense, should be more just. In cultural sense, should be more accommodative. And in this new global order, Turkey will play a significant role. Because we are right at the center of historical flow, 
and we will continue to be on the right side of history, like today in Syria, in Libya, or in other issues, we will be always on the side of democratic forces, on the side of the people who are demanding more freedom, more dignity, more prosperity. That is the flow of history, the direction of the flow, and the future of the global order will be specified not only by a certain nation, group of nations, but by all humanity, and Turkey will be at the center of all historical transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Foreign Minister Davutoglu has graciously agreed to answer some questions from the audience. My name is Ercin. Uh, I'm a second year MBA student from Turkey. Uh, so I have a question regarding that. Uh, you mentioned the US is a very strategically close ally of Turkey. And uh, we have always pursued like EU membership and uh, maybe with less excitement than compared to previously. Uh, and also the Turkey's actually popularity has been increasing a lot in the Middle East and among the Muslim countries. And you also mentioned that uh, Turkey has a like, historical alliance with Turanic nations on the East. And we have like energy like uh, agreements with Russia and also increasing trades with China. And considering all these, uh, where Turkey will move uh, politically socially and financially in the upcoming years? Will it be a one direction or will it be in separated directions in different areas? Thank you. Thank you. This is a very valid question because uh, in last 10 years there were several articles, sometimes criticism, uh, about shift of access from uh, west to east, from Europe to Asia. Whenever there was a new initiative by in foreign policy, we were questioned, is Turkey uh, shifting the axis or uh, a new paradigm is emerging? When we look at all these uh, in last nine years and today, uh, Turkish foreign policy is based on our geography and history as two permanent parameters. What is our geography? Our geography says to us that Turkey cannot be one-dimensional one regional uh, country. Turkey is a Balkan country, Turkey is a Caucasian country, Turkey is a Middle Eastern country, Turkey is a European country, Asian country. Sometimes it is surprising. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have to write uh, uh, my diaries regularly, but sometimes it is so interesting. From the mor morning, I am starting with uh, one commission last week, European commissioner. Then uh, uh, an Afri uh, Afghan minister, then someone, a leader from Iraq, uh, someone from Balkans. In the same day, seven, eight regions. This is, I didn't specify, or Turkish nation did not specify the, its geography. This is our geography. We don't have the luxury to choice. For example, of course, I respect the Scandinavian countries. They are all our good friends. but. The challenges of Scandinavian geography or the challenges of Latin American geography is different than our challenges. Therefore, I said our direction is based on our geography. And we are not, and it is not contradictory. Some people think that if you have good relations with EU, with uh, EU, you should have problematic relations with the uh, Muslim countries. Or if you have good relations with the United States, you, you may have problems with Russia. No, today. Russia is our second trade partner because they are our neighbor. We have a historical relations and United States is our model partner as it has been described by Obama. Today in uh, Europe we are very influential in the sense of foreign policy despite of all the barriers in front of us in integration but all European ministers know very well, leaders know very well when it comes to the issues in Balkans, this is Turkish uh, perspective. Once a European minister gave me a paper on Bosnia to speak with Bosniak side, I said, look, I took, I didn't read the paper. I said, and this is our geographical and historical necessity. I said, a paper cannot be given to a, to a Turkish minister on Bosnia. A paper should be either rewritten together and then work together 
or written by us and give to you. Why? What do I mean by this? We are paying the price of all these events. When there was a war in Bosnia, they turned their face to Istanbul. They migrated to Turkey. When there was a war in Kosovo, same. When there was a war in Iraq, Kurds migrated to Turkey. When today, Syria crisis, 25,000 Syrians came to Turkey. They didn't go elsewhere because they think that Turkey is strong enough to protect them. We are paying the price. Then we will be there wherever any decision being taken on these regions. This is, these are our regions. We do not impose anything on them. We are part of the process. Economically, we are, we are member of G20. We are member of OECD. We are accepting free market economy, but we have our own characteristics. We cannot implement the same strategy like some European countries because we lost decades, decades, because of uh, not being implementing consistent economic policies and having a direction uh, towards economic development. Now we have our own development model. We have our own authentic foreign policy model, our authentic political model. So nobody should question where Turkey is leading. Turkey is flowing in the history, but in the right side of the history, not against the history. This is the basic philosophy of us. Thank you. Um, First of all, thank you very much for coming to speak to us. Your talk was very interesting. Um, it seems like a lifetime- Your name, sorry. Oh, my name is Leah. Leah? Yes. Okay. Um, it seems like a lifetime ago that Turkey uh, was serving as an intermediary between Israel and Syria um, over the Golan. And when I read about Turkish foreign policy, such as you know, no problems with neighbors, it seems like there's a disconnect with its policy uh, with Israel, what principles guide you in your in your pol in the policy decisions you make regarding regarding Israel? Okay. Uh, first of all, one historical background there. Yeah. Uh, in our history, there is no any negative attitude or legacy regarding our Jewish friends, neighbors and uh, citizens of Turkey and, and in the past as well. We had excellent relations, and whenever there was any atrocity against Jews in Europe, they found safe haven first in Ottomans, then in Turkish Republic. In 1492, Ottoman state brought Jews from, Jewish population from uh, Spain, uh, to Saloniki, to Semirna, to Izmir, to Istanbul in the best places, and they continue to be there. Same in Second World War and later, whenever there was a problem, Turkey was safe haven. And Turkey will continue to be safe haven for all those nations who are victims of oppression. Full stop. Jews, Muslims, Christians, no matter. Today, Syrians are our guests. Tomorrow, if there is another massacre or any problem on Jewish, Jewish population everywhere in the world, Turkey is safe haven for them, regardless of our relation with Israel. Turkey is safe haven of all victims. This is our tradition. With Israel, Turkey is the first country recognizing Israel. Good, had good relations. During our government, we had good relations. And that good relations was so intensified in 2008 when I was chief advisor to Prime Minister Erdogan. We mediated between Syria and Israel and we were very close to a peace in, 19, in 2008 December. Prime Minister Olmert was in Ankara in the residence of Prime Minister Erdogan, stayed seven hours there and by phone we had telephone diplomacy with Bashar Assad, Syria with Bashar Assad in order to start direct talks. And since I was mediating in next one week, it was Monday, next Monday we were supposed to meet and until Saturday we resolved everything, only one word was missing 
And we were expecting to start peace talks between Israel and Syria. On Monday, Saturday, Israel started attack against Gaza. They, were, they did not wait two days for, for peace negotiation. They destroyed Gaza. In one hour, 150 people were killed, women and children. And in one month, more than 1,500 people were killed by phosphoric bombs sometimes. And of course, we had good relations with Israel. But for us, values are more important than any relation. If somebody attacks to women and ladies, uh, children, attacks to a urban area without any discrimination, Turkey's position is clear, will be clear, and will continue to be clear. But despite of these, our relations continued. And when they attacked uh, a civilian convoy and killed nine Turkish, one Turkish American citizen in international waters, these people did not violate Israeli territory, did not even go to Gaza, and they were killed. We requested from Israel apology, compensation, and and of siege, helping Gaza together with them. They, in the last two years, they, did, they insisted several times they approached us that they are ready to apologize, but they didn't do. And we took a clear position. Uh, once I spoke with one Israeli minister during this crisis, and I told him, look, you have to decide whether we are friends or not friends or enemy. If we are friends, you should apologize because you killed our people. We had several wars with other nations like Russians, but they didn't kill our citizens during peacetime. We had difficulties with Greece, but they didn't do this. You did. And you, we had good relations. And you know that Turks were the only friends of you throughout the history. Now it is time for you to apologize if we are friends. This is our policy and this will continue to be our policy. We are a nation of dignity. Nobody can kill our citizens. Nobody can touch our citizens in international waters. Whoever is that city, Israel or any other city. And Turkey is strong enough to, to defend the rights of its citizens. This is our policy and this will continue to be our policy. It is not against Jews, Jewish people, wherever they are. They are the best uh, friends for us everywhere. In Turkey, they are our citizens. Outside Turkey, we had good uh, relations. It is not against people of Israel who are also criticizing their government, not because of not apologizing. I, last year, September, I was for UN meeting. I was visiting Metropolitan Museum. Somebody came with his mother. He said he's an Israeli. And he said, Mr. Minister, he knew, knew me, I didn't know him, of course. He said, Minister Davutoglu. And he started, he started to recite a Turkish religious song. He visited Konya, he knows Turkish culture. He said, Mr. Minister, on behalf of our people, I apologize. Please don't uh, take our government seriously. We, un we know that you are right. We don't have problem with peoples. But it is our right to defend our nation. It is our right to ask if somebody kills our citizens. And we will continue to ask this. They know how to improve, normalize relations with Turkey. We hope they will understand the significance of Turkey, Turkish-Israeli uh, Turkish relations. And we hope that they will understand the new uh, regional and international context where Turkey plays a significant role. Thank you. Just, just one moment. So, at the moment we have a microphone on each side of the room, so if you would like to ask a question, if you wouldn't mind going towards the microphone, that would be, that would be helpful. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Minister. Wa alaikum um, salam. Your name? Is, my name is Ifrah Magan, and Ifrah, Ifrah. Ifrah Magan, and I'm originally from Somalia. I'm Somalia. An alum, yes, 
I'm an alum of the social work program here, and I also lived at the International House. Um, first and foremost, thank you very much for all your efforts in Somalia. Uh, the Turkish government uh, has brought back Somalia in the scene and reconnected Somalia with the rest of the world. My um, question to you is that I know that you've participated in the London uh, Summit on Somalia, and um, there are a lot of discussions around, you know, will the transition federal government end in August, and that's its deadline. Can you talk about um, the next steps, what, you know, some of the things that were discussed at the summit, and I know that the Turkish government has agreed to um, host the next summit on Somalia. I would appreciate yes. that. Thank you. Yes, uh, on 1st of June, we will be organizing the second UN conference on Somalia in Istanbul. So even today I was making some telephone calls for this. So uh, that is a UN uh, conference uh, organized with us. And tomorrow, in fact from here, I will go to airport uh, after the ch visiting ch a Syrian church. And tomorrow in UN, we, I will uh, discuss this with UN Secretary General. We want to have a successful conference. And uh, we want to, uh, especially to plan after the end of this interim period, uh, after August, what will be happening. Uh, and this time, not, uh, unlike London conference, it will not be only official conference, but we are planning to invite around 300 elderly uh, tribal leaders, scholars, intellectuals, representatives of diaspora to Turkey as well to bring them together in order to help to this political process. There are three things should, which should be done in Somalia. One is nation reconciliation. The Somalian identity, to revive it and to make it uh, uh, prevailing in all Somalian territory. That nation reconciliation is important. A consistent, uh, well-functioning economic program, uh, because first time when I went Mogadishu with Prime Minister Erdogan, uh, you know, when we landed, two, there were two airplanes. It was, in fact, a uh, risk for us because I think seven, eight ministers, we were all in, in the plane with Prime Minister Erdogan, with our wives, children. Uh, when the second airplane, when they, it landed, it hit to the uh, ground and there was an accident because of the uh, insufficiency of the a a a airport, not uh, up to the standard. Uh, from that time, we decided to have uh, a new economic program for uh, Somalia. We have a special branch in Turkey just to concentrate concentrating on Somalia, how to develop Somalia. In one month, Turkish people donated 300 million US dollars for Somalia. This is NGO part. But when we went there, we decided to reconstruct airport. We did some rehabilitation in airport. From airport to to the city, we rehabilitated the, all the roads. We are reconstructing health. We are building a new parliament uh, building complex. So this is important to give a self-confidence to Somalian people that country is changing in a positive way. Nation reconciliation, economic development, uh, and well-functioning political institution and state structure. In all these three fields, we will be focusing in detailed discussion in our conference, and with UN, we will do more. But what is the uh, problem here? Unfortunately, international community is uh, promising many things, but not fulfilling enough. Last year in September, when we had Somalia meeting in UN, in UN General Assembly, many countries promised to open embassy. Only Turkey opened embassy in October, no other country until yet. They are trying to deal with Somalia from Nairobi, from Kenya. But this, no, if you want to help a people, you have to live with. And we appointed an ambassador who is an NGO uh, uh, leader, worked in uh, Africa, in many African countries. And in one night when we were there, when we decided to open embassy with Prime Minister Erdogan, I called him, he was my classmate, uh, I mean friend from high school time, his wife and his uh, family friend, and they are doctors, leader of Dr. Walsh, Doctors Worldwide. Next day, 
He came to Somalia to start the work. There, this is a volunteer. It is not a diplomatic issue. It is not an issue of interest. It is not an issue of strategic discussion and negotiation. It is an issue of something from your heart. Voluntarily, you have to help. This, without that, it will be difficult to deal with this problem. Otherwise, Somalia is very rich. Long cost, more, more than 2,000 kilometers, Kodni cost. So uh, we are optimistic. What you need to do as Somali people, uh, I met with the leaders of diaspora, with our president, we told the same thing to them. You have to unite in diaspora. There are people trying to have different positions vis-a-vis -vis Somaliland, vis-a-vis Puntiland. No, there is, we recognize only one Somalia, Somalia, Somalian identity, and you have a strong manpower outside Somalia in diaspora. You should unite and help us. We assure you that we will continue to help you. This is our uh, responsibility as uh, human beings and, of course, brothers and sisters of Somalia. And that will continue forever. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for just one more question uh, over here on uh, my right. Sayın Bakanım, konuşmanız için teşekkür ederim. I'll ask my question in English. Um, after all the protests and, um, do, and recent NATO summit, my question is, what is the object of NATO's nemesis in Afghanistan in terms of country insurgency policies? And what does Turkey think about the future of Afghanistan? Will Turkey be strong enough to manipulate NATO's uh, policy, especially after you mentioned this authentic policy towards Afghanistan and how friendly Turkish uh, military approaches to Afghanistan? What do you think about that? Thank you. Uh, I will differentiate this NATO and Afghanistan first, then you unite. Uh, NATO is a uh, collective defense, collective security organization. The allies of NATO, they are committed for their own, uh, for their uh, security. So it is not an offensive organization. In principle, in charter and everything, it is basically a defensive organization, defense of uh, territories of NATO countries. Of course, there may be some cases where NATO uh, did mistakes or uh, sometimes may do mistake. We have to be, whenever necessary, we have to have autocriticism inside NATO or regarding the, the objectives of NATO. But at the end of the day, I can tell you, in Bosnia, when 300,000 people were killed and Turkey was raising voice, asking people to help, UN sent uh, peacekeepers and declares safe heaven, safe zone in Srebrenica. One day, some UN soldiers withdrew from Srebrenica. Despite of that declaration, in two nights, 8,700 people were killed, massacred. Who had to come there? A NATO operation requested by Turkey, led by United States, was the only instrument to help. Otherwise, that massacre would have continued. Of course, sometimes as a, I am also, when I was in university, I was more revolutionary than many of these, those who are protesting today. Uh, we were very critical against the culture of violence. Still, we don't want to have culture of violence. But if there is a, a threat to uh, human beings, there should be an, uh, an organization which can respond. Strong army is uh, not the only objective. Strong army or strong defense structures is an instrument. It depends who is using this instrument for what. That instrument is not itself is not good or bad. Today, if NATO with these objectives, trying to defend the values, and the territories of NATO allies is an asset for global security. You may criticize Libya operation, but at the end of the day, of course, when Gaddafi massacred his own people, there was a need of hard power to be used, which we didn't want. As Turkey, we were not in favor of this at the beginning, hoping that we could, we could convince, we could stop. But when diplomacy ends and doesn't create a result, there should be something, a 
power to stop these massacres in this Arab Spring we specify two principles as Turkey one we will support the rightful demands of people second we will use diplomacy till the end to resolve the issue but when diplomacy doesn't do anything there should be a coercive power to stop these uh, massacres today in Syria. How can we stop these massacres still every day continuing? There's, in that sense, NATO, as I said, is a mechanism, is, a, is, a, is an asset. It depends how to use it, when to use it, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in the case of Libya. In Afghanistan, there was uh, a civil war and there was a uh, a situation of insecurity, and of course, after 9-11, there was an intervention. Again, it depends how you act there. Turkey participated in this, as, not as a combat force, but we are now in Afghanistan chairing the command of Kabul, and God forsake, except two accidents, one helicopter, one car accident, there was no attack to Turkish soldiers. Because we gave them an instruction. We said, whenever you see the people, you will not turn your weapon to the people. Your weapons should be down. Afghan people is our, our nation. They should not see Turkish soldier like someone there who is trying to control or oppress. No Turkish soldier can use gun like this in, Afghan, in Kabul street, always down. And sometimes other nations are using Turkish flag in their uh, dress when they go difficult jobs because when Afghan people see Turkish flag, they stop. I mean, they just greet and express attitude. Why? Because in 1921, when Turkey was doing, now I am coming to Afghan issue, when Turkish army, Turkish nation, was fighting for liber uh, independence before Sakarya war. There was a few Turkish soldiers who, after almost 15 years of war, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk wrote a letter to Fevzi Çakmak, the commander-in-chief of Turkish army. He said, Marshal, you will choose the best officers of our army and you will send to Afghanistan to train Afghan army to defend their lands. At that time, we, were, we needed even one soldier. And the best officers of Turkish army was, were selected and they were sent to Afghan, Afghanistan to organize Afghan army to defend their lands against colonialists. And the first Afghan national army was established by Turkish officers. The first Afghan universities were established in 1930s by Turkish officers, by Turkish professors. The first Afghan state institutions were built by Turkish professors, by, 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 by Turkish bureaucrats. This is our relation with Afghanistan. And when we needed even one penny, one kurush, to defend our lands, Afghan ladies Indian ladies, Muslim ladies at that time, Pakistan was part of India. They sent their ring of wedding, their last uh, uh, jewel to Turkey to help Turkish army. We will never forget their assistance and they never forget our brotherhood and how we help them. Therefore, even if NATO leaves Afghanistan, we will continue to be Afghanistan in economic development, in building, in when we went to Afghanistan with Prime Minister Erdogan in 2005, when we said at that time our economy was not so strong, he ordered in next year, in next three years, $250 million will be donated, will be used for Afghan schools, Afghan hospitals, Afghan PRTs. And this was the biggest donation, I mean, uh, uh, donor activity of Turkey in Republican era. So this is a special relation with Afghanistan. Of course, inside NATO we will help, we will participate, we will do everything for uh, establishing to strengthen 
Afghan National Security Forces, but even after 2014, Afghanistan will be always in our agenda. Together with Pakistan, as two brotherly nations, we are organizing trilateral conference and several other activities in order to bring peace, prosperity, and stability to Afghanistan. Afghanistan is the heart of Asia, and it is in our heart forever. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Foreign Minister. It's been a delight to have this opportunity to listen to you talk. Uh, I appreciated your mentioning the, the, the motto of the University of Chicago, which is, you know, is in two parts, Crescat Ciencia, let knowledge increase, uh, Vita Escalator, may the world improve, may life improve. It seems to me clear after what you had to say today and your capacity to answer questions, I think for many hours, did your schedule allow this, uh, that should you decide to leave politics, we would be delighted to welcome you back to the higher <laughs> school. But this time... I am sure my wife and my children will be very happy if that happens. Be one, there would be one difference between that visit and the current visit. Next time we would like you to come back as Hoja. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>